Today we break with tradition. We have a very special guest, a mover and shaker in the community for many years. And the number of topics we cover is amazing. The Top of the Morning Club, maybe Kansas City's second oldest Irish group. Strawberry Hill, St. Mary's, the first church now defunct. The Irish Patch, ethnic areas in Kansas, Kansas City, Kansas. When the Irish went on strike and brought in the Eastern European immigrants. The 1901 flood, St. Bridget's, the second Irish church to go defunct, the Civil War, the Sister City Program, Mayor Reardon, the Falcon Club, the Irish Brigade, B&Bs yesterday and today, travel and more. Let's go. I'm Michael Laughlin bringing you this podcast from the Irish Roots Cafe and irishroots.com. Episode number 11. When the Missouri Irish met Peter Adams, who became more Irish than the Irish themselves. Today, we've got our special guest that we've interviewed and talked with before, Mr. Peter Adams. And I can't think of anybody who crosses uh, more lines in Kansas City history in in recent times, virtually uh, working with all the groups and volunteering for everybody and uh, just generally holding the community together in a very special way. That's Peter Adams. And I... uh, Thought we'd talk about Kansas City History Day as part of our Kansas City History podcast, which is separate from our uh, major Irish Families podcast at the Irish Roots Cafe. Uh, Peter, how are you doing today? Good, Michael. It's glad to be here in the cafe. I see you've had a, you must have had a big bustling crowd in here with the coffee cups sitting all around. Well, we did, but Molly was pouring out all her Irish coffee she could possibly handle, and then I had to keep it quiet. I didn't want to tell anybody you were coming in because... The minute you walked in the door, it's like, oh, there's Peter Adams. I have him sing a song. I have him sing one in Gaelic. Do they? And so I wanted to get this interview first before anybody else actually found out we were doing it. Well, I'm glad. Usually I've, I've walked in a number of places, and some guys would use me as an excuse to stay and have one more. And then they'd go home and tell their wife, oh, but Peter came in. I had to also. Uh, I was blamed for a lot of things over the years. And if it wasn't for your charm and personality, you'd have a thousand wives after you right now. That's but- the truth. <laughs> You're a lucky man. You know, we're looking for some informal impressions and some facts on Kansas City, say, in, in your era, era from the year you came in. You might give that year. And when you hit the ground in Kansas City, what year was it? And what was your first contact with any of the parts of the Kansas City Irish American community at that time? Well, uh, I kind of had two times of coming to Kansas City because I was— uh, well, as you know, when you first met me, I was a member of a religious order, and uh, so I, I really didn't know too much about the Irish then. But in 1971, imagine back that far, I encountered uh, Father Ray Gaver in Kansas City, Kansas, and Father was from Limerick, from Bally Landers in County Limerick. And uh, because I was Irish and I played the guitar and had a great interest in music, he wanted me to come to his parish and play a guitar mass. And in the early 70s, uh, that was the latest thing. It was the new vogue to have a guitar in your church. Uh, Not everybody liked it all the time, but that's what we did. And Father was probably my introduction to the uh, Irish here. And then after I left the monastery, uh, and Father being a friend, uh, he introduced me to the ancient order of Hibernians. So I started meeting some of the fellows. But at that time, uh, though I was in Kansas, that group was in Missouri. But Father had been the chaplain of the AOH. Now, at that time, there were, there were no chapters in Kansas City, Kansas at that time. There was not. Of none. the AOH, even though back in the 1800s, as we talked about before, there were several uh, chapters, and it just sort of faded out a- as things will, but there's a rhythm to that, and it's it's come back to, to today where there is actually one again, isn't there? Yes. Well, not in Kansas City, Kansas, there is not. Uh, in, in the state of Kansas, there's one uh, in Johnson County, Kansas, which is really Overland Park, Kansas. Right. They have formed a chapter there. Okay, but so in Kansas City, Kansas itself, we do not have a, a specific chapter. And it's surprising for such a, uh, really, they retain more of an ethnic flavor, or at least have in the last few decades, than sure. uh, Kansas City, Missouri, as far as neighborhoods. and Yes, they have. I think uh, part of the reason, though, is that uh, it's so close to be able to go to the, I belong to the Missouri chapter, not the Kansas chapter, uh, and actually to go to the Missouri meeting, it's closer to me to go to the Missouri one than it is to go to the Kansas one. 
Oh, I, yeah, I can understand that. It's just, so it, it's a convenience on that part. And uh, we all started with the uh, Patrick Pierce Division in Kansas City, Missouri. And so I've just remained with them because I joined them about, like, about 19... 19- 76 or so. Now, what how, about how many people would you say were there in 76 and what were their activities? What did they do specifically? You mean with the Hibernians and yes. that kind of a group? Well, I remember they would uh, socialize a lot uh, and do uh, some little fundraisers, uh, try to find a cause and help a family. And then they would have dances. And then you use them also as a way of uh, information that they'd be able to tell you if there was an Irish band coming to a particular place. And then there was, in the mid-70s, there was the beginning of um, Irish bars that brought people in on circuits right. from various places. And so we used to go to those, and a lot of the Hibernians would be there. But I met the, the Hibernians that I met were real Irish, and what I mean by real Irish is they were from Ireland. Right, and what and was they, the ratio back then? Do you have any idea? You know, that's difficult. I, I know that of the of the group that I would see at various places, probably 40% were Irish-born, and then the rest were people whose maybe grandparents had been, and then the children of the Irish-born. Right. And then I became friends with them because I wound up as a singer in the Irish group. Well, that's and right. you know how it is in Ireland. You know, if you sing, you're a guest everywhere. All the doors are open. That's right. And they, of course, they become your friend. It's the greatest, uh, what, what am I saying, in order to break the ice, so to speak, of becoming a friend of somebody. When you sing a song, and as I have, whether it be in Ireland or whether it be here in Kansas City, that immediately changes the atmosphere and it changes the way people are going to respond to me. That's right. And it just happens all the time. And and you sang, oh, I can't can't imagine all different things. I know you sang for the Hibernians at several of their events. Many of their events, yes. Uh, I used to sing the national anthems, uh, the American and the Irish. And then I also would, uh, at many times, I would be the Irish entertainment, uh, playing the guitar. And then I'd try to have a little group together and we'd play. And there was a time uh, in Kansas City... Uh, back in, oh my gosh, back in the 70s, there was on Main Street in Kansas City a place called the Falcon Club. Right, that would have been, it's, it's Harlings today, is That's correct, Harlings in Kansas City. Yeah. It's about 30, Westport Road and uh, and Main Street. That might be the best known uh, pub from the old days, really. The, I think the, it the, is. The one name everybody would recognize. Yes, yeah. From, from what would you say, the 50s, 60s? I think, so. the, I think the Falcon Club started in the late 50s. Yeah, yeah, and then it changed names. Then it changed, became Harlings, and it used to be a little elevated where you went upstairs. It oh, was almost it was scary. Dangerous, yeah. yeah I and think. you could fit two people in there. Yeah. And St. Patrick's Day, forget it. Oh. You couldn't walk in no, the place. The back couldn't. room was full. This, the whole room was full. I know we we had we gave, we had gave dance instruction back there in that back room for a, while, for a couple of weeks with the Irish American Cultural Center. Uh, and they went on to become the Clan of Aaron Dancers. Uh, now, the Hibernians, what about the parade during your time, uh, the St. Patrick's Day parade? Who were the movers well, and shakers? You know, there, there was no parade. Uh, right. And when I first remember, first started coming here. But then, as we know, in about 1974 or 5, 6, right in there. Right. It, uh, yeah, it had to be that, 75, I think it was, that Mike Murphy, uh, who was a radio personality here, he started it with a friend uh, who owned... Um, who owned a, a pub down in, in, in downtown Kansas City, Missouri, and their parade was silly. I mean, they walked from one bar to the next, That's, we just almost down did, the street. We did that at your house one year. We, we did. did. Yeah, Five so or ten of us walked around the walk, block. Walk and, around the block. And out. In this That's case, when I started having my own parade. <laughs> it's in this case, that parade grew into what? That parade grew into what they say uh, is one of the largest parades in the, in the country. I think it's about the fifth in size depending on in the United have, States. Depending right. on who's counting the people. Sure. Uh, yeah, I think so. You, you can change that. But then everybody sort of enlarges their parade the same percentage, so it might... It, it all boils down to about the same. Right, but it started that one day, and then it, the next year, they decided, well, let's plan something a little bit more. And I think by the third or the fourth year, uh, it really started to take off, and I know then the Hibernians got involved... And uh, I remember meeting downtown on 12th Street in Kansas City, Missouri, right. seeing all the Hibernians and all the Irish. But I ran over, for, I was working in a bank at the time, and I ran over from there at lunchtime to see it. And then I had to run back 
And, and, and today you couldn't run in and out because of the crowds and trying to park. Oh, but in those right. days like you, you could. And I went to see everybody and wishing that I could be marching. And then the next year I changed and started working at the college. And I decided, well, not only are we going, we're taking a group of students with us and we're going to have a float and we're going to do. And it just started to grow and grow and grow. And the whole city's done that. Now it's so big that uh, you really. They're 30 years. And you have to be careful to keep uh, to keep an Irish flavor on it. It gets so big you encompass right. the whole city, which is good. But you have to remember the whole point is that it is an Irish festival and you have to remember, have some meaning to it as well. Exactly. I remember back in the 80s we had. Uh, one year, I was on that parade committee, too, and there was I remember when it hit 200 floats, that was a big deal. Yes. We had 200 entries in the parade, and we had to start enforcing rules like you can no longer throw little pieces of candy off the float right. because you could be in a lawsuit. And, and children would, could run, would run for the candy and, they and get could be hurt, be run That's over. Right. So it changed from a small thing where you walked around the block from a pub into this, this large event where, where it's almost an ethnic memory just draws people to it. From the past. That's right. And, we took- and today, it's um, they had to limit the size. Right. Because the police department, because of other things that happen in cities, I mean, it's just the way it goes, uh, limited them to a two-hour marching time. So you can take so long. They could, of course, prepare. And they left up there at whatever that is, 24th Street, Pershing, isn't that about 24th? Right. And then come down Grand Avenue, which was a street, interestingly enough, made for parades. It's the Grand Avenue was that in mind, I think, actually with the American Royal Great Parade in Kansas City. Right, right. And, and there's not as much a problem there. The ethnic thing has does inspire a little bit more enthusiasm. And unfortunately... Uh, they decided that it should be a carte blanche to just drink all day long, no matter what you are or who you are, and that's not always the best thing. It's caused some problems. Well, that's right, and that's just something you have to deal with in a, in a big city. And I remember, uh, you know, we, we hit 200 entries uh, in back in the 1980s, and that was a big deal. But then I was looking back in history, and when Father Donnelly was uh, 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 buried, they had 200 conveyances in his funeral procession, too, and that was— about a hundred years earlier, so wow. it's amazing how it, it things change, but they don't. We just we've forgotten a lot of it. So hopefully, we can dig a lot more up here on on this podcast. Uh, well, you know, one of the things when you ask about you know that's how the parade emerged, and I too was on the parade committee. I was one of those who was supposed to be helping uh, plan things, but I really am not a parade planning person. You know, <laughs> it just wasn't my my you, forte. You got the doers and the talkers. You that's know? the truth. And I wasn't really too sure about, because of the logistical things and the, all of the difficult things. It's not just having a parade. But when I decided that I will just have my own parade in my neighborhood around the cathedral in Kansas City, Kansas, right. uh, I started at my house and had everybody line up on the side. We started on one corner and we waited till, uh, usually there was mass every evening at five o'clock. Right. So we waited till mass was over and then we would begin our parade. So people were at my house uh, from say, I would say having an open house and have them starting coming in about three. They'd leave the parade over town then come over and we'd march around the neighborhood and you've done that with us. I've also had uh, two governors, Congress city council members and mayors come my parade became the the, the social event for Kansas City Kansas oh it was that's just how it's the spirit of the thing <laughs> that's right takes over. that's how it started it's amazing what about that uh, uh more about the Kansas City Kansas side you're I know you're a, a citizen of the world so you embrace the all the communities but you have a special contact with the the Kansas side what were some of the groups and activities on, on that side that you've seen in the last few decades well one that probably emerged the greatest. Uh, and that really began in the 50s, in the early 50s, or even even the late 40s. There was a group of uh, leaders in the Kansas City, Kansas community. Uh, there was a Judge McHale who uh, had a group who would meet at his house uh, in about 1947, of Irishman, a fellow Irishman. And I was looking uh, at the high school I'm working at now, uh, and there's Judge McHale as one of the graduates of uh, Catholic High way back when. Right. And he found the Irish folks, and he would invite them to his house for a small St. Patrick's Day dinner. 
Right. Well, kind of like what I did with having the thing, had people at my house for St. Patrick's Day because other things that go on in the community. Right. Well, Judge McHale did that. And then as he had a few groups and some of them decided, let's go to Ireland. So apparently sometime in 1950 or 51, imagine going to Ireland those years was a little bit more difficult. Oh, very few people had gone back gone and go to see. So they did. And while they were over in Ireland, they were sitting around one evening talking about being Irish and how nice it is here. They decided, why don't we have a, a formal club? And when we go home, and they did it at uh, one of the hotels uh, in downtown Kansas City, uh, what was it called? The Townhouse Hotel was called. It's no longer, the building is there, but the hotel's gone. And they would meet there for breakfast on St. Patrick's Day. And as a result, uh, that expression, which is not Irish, but which came about because of the of the movies and the, uh, the little bit of a, a clownish type of an attitude towards that, right. top of the morning to you. And the rest of the day That's to yourself. That's the expression. It is. Yes, so yes. in Ireland, I had uh, a friend of mine in Irish say to me, what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> and how did you explain it? <laughs> I said, "Well, I have to eat. I said it's just something we say. To, it's a wish. It's a greeting for the day." And he says, "Never heard it over here. Never heard it." Well, you know, in the early days, you, you see a lot of people talk about you had to wear a sprig of green, or just they just did it. You'd wear a sprig of green in your suit, your vest. Mm-hmm. Do they still do that today? Here in two thousand seven. In Ireland? In here, in, in uh, Kansas City. Oh, my God. They're, they're, they're overwhelmed with how much green they think they need to put on. As a matter of fact, there's too much dead green on you. It should be maybe one sprig of live green would be worth it. supposed to be. You know, yeah. they, they paint themselves green, and they have terrible hats and, and suits. Lights and bulbs on their hats that yes. go off and on and little funny ears. And, and, you know, and what people don't realize, first of all, green is not the national color of Ireland. Right. Blue is. Yeah. And for the Irish... To wear too much green was bad luck. Ah. And the wearer of the green is the shamrock. What you wore, you wore the shamrock. That's and right. to this day in Ireland, if you go to mass uh, or to church uh, in Ireland, in the churches there's usually a huge set, set and of plants of shamrock. And you go up and you take some of your shamrock and you pin it on you when you go out to the parade. Now that seems a more fitting way to celebrate a saint's day, wouldn't Absolutely. you think? Oh, sure. And you know, yes, it is a national holiday and a holy day, but it's St. Patrick who brought us the old story of, of a group standing around and saying, oh, St. Patrick, what did St. Patrick do for Ireland? And uh, one answered and he says, well, I believe St. Patrick brought Christianity to Ireland. Uh, and another one said, well, what else did he do? What else did he do? And the other response was, wasn't that enough? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and of course, right. the, the shamrock is the symbol of Patrick's teaching. Well, and, and that's why it's important. And St. Patrick's Day in Ireland, in the 60s, 70s, it was a holy day. It wasn't yes. a festival, so to speak. And right. it, it passed probably rather quietly most of the time. And, and everything was closed. Yeah. It would yeah. be like Christmas here. You know? It wasn't a commercial day at, at all. all. Not at all. Although now I think it's changing. They now have a big parade in Dublin, which they never used to have. And so... Actually, they got the big parade from us, even though we got St. Patrick from them. Exactly. Uh, yeah, it's, it's our influence. <laughs> the one thing that was on St. Patrick's Day, which I find interesting, was the horse races. Right. And you could go to the horse races, but in Irish law, apparently at the time, the only place you could have a pint was at the horse races on that day because all the pubs would be closed. Uh, the country. Yeah. So they yeah. had massive numbers of people going to the horse races. And they said as soon as that law changed and they didn't have it, you had fewer people going to the horse races. Hey, that's so right. White people went to the track using that as a place to celebrate. Now, is the Top of the Morning Club still around? Oh, it is. In okay. fact, it's, it's probably the second longest reigning Irish organization in the city. Without a doubt. Yeah, yeah. Hibernians being the first. Sure. Yeah. And then Top of the Morning Club. And the, it's gone from, uh, we've taken it, and I was president of the top of the morning club once upon a time. Right. And I'm, we've kind of formed out of it, like we called it the board of directors, and it's everybody who's ever been president. Right. Which, you know, if you figure that our first president was actually in 1953, uh-huh. well, of course, that has changed because so many of them have passed on. But uh, those of us who are still around, there's 17 of us. 
And so about a month before St. Patrick's Day, we have a dinner, just ourselves. Right. We invite all the presidents and just the presidents. Excellent. And who can do it? And I'm usually the chef for the occasion. I would think that's um, fitting. I, yeah. I do that. And I started that tradition. It started in my house. That figures. Because I, I didn't want it to be, a, you know, we used to get together and we'd talk about it. And I said, but when are we really planning what we're going to do and talk over some of the things we find to be important? So I started inviting everybody to my home and cooking this big dinner. And from the, from, as what do we say, from uh, uh, soup to nuts, you know, that whole, right, that whole thing right. across the board. <laughs> and we'd have a wonderful time and we'd discuss. I, they'd come at 5 or 5.30 in the evening. And sometimes they wouldn't leave till 2 in the morning. Right. I mean, because we'd get into, well, whatever it was we were getting into. <laughs> and we'd talk about that. But now it's at someone else's house uh, who wanted to do it. His house is bigger. And so we have about 17 come in my day. It was probably only 10. And how many of you could sit at the table? Well, and, you know, that's almost the most unreported Irish story in the city. The second uh, most longest lived group in the city is really the top of the morning club. That's right. Yeah. Now, what about... Well, let me just, let me yeah. just tell you. After that dinner, that's when we plan what we now call the party that the Irish, the top of the morning club, throws for other members in the community. Right. And so though there were 17 of us at dinner... Uh, then we had the party, and there was over a hundred people who came to the party. And we have a corn, but we do the American tradition. I don't have corned beef and cabbage at my dinner. I serve uh, something more in the Irish from the vegetables and the meats and those things that are more more standard to what you might find in Ireland. Right. And yet, at the at the top of the morning club party. We have corned beef and cabbage, and everybody comes, and they have a great time. And it's it's a men's club, as it started as a men's club. Right. But along with that, about 10 years ago, some of the wives uh, of the members decided, well, you know, you guys are all out having a good time. We're going to start a top-of-the-morning club for women. Uh-huh. And they referred to that's called the, uh, the Colleen's of the top of the morning club. Oh, I like that. And so they have their own party simultaneously. And then after, then we get together for uh, a final and then to go home, you know, because sometimes it goes late. But so there is also now a woman's part of the uh, top of the morning club. Well, that sure goes with the 20th century with uh, oh, sure. women's rights and more active in, in society. You I know, will tell you that this year, a, a couple of them said, do you think that after the meeting, which we say we're meeting because we have the new officers are announced at the big party meeting, even though the, they're really elected during our private meeting. Right. Uh, every, and the, so one of the guys had said, do you think, why don't we invite the women to come after they finish theirs? They could come on over to ours, and we could say. And so they naturally had me broach the subject with the rest of them. So I went and I said, "Well, uh, ladies, now you may be a little surprised at this, but uh, uh, we're just wondering: Would you be interested in coming?" And you know what I got? No, we're not. So- oh, that's amazing! <laughs> They're not going to have any part of it because they ended up cleaning up. That's you know? right. <laughs> There's some ulterior motive There's something there somewhere in there that needed to be. Uh, I'll be needed what, to be looked at. One of the things I've heard <laughs> when I was over in Kansas. City, Kansas back 20, 30 years ago, probably the most ethnic phrase or ethnic place that I remember, not being a native of KCK, although my folks came, uh, my uh, father's family came from there, was Strawberry Hill. Now, what kind of ethnic uh, connection does Strawberry Hill have? Well, today, well, today, actually, you don't know what it is. In memory, in the recent time, it's considered to be Croatian. Right. Uh, Strawberry Hill is a... It is and it was uh, a large section of land as you came into the state of Kansas from the Missouri side and along the, the Kansas River, which just beyond there, it formed with the Missouri River. So you, it's near the fork of the two rivers. Right. And it, um, a highway went in, I-70, anybody traveling through Kansas or coming west or going east, I mean, it co- covers the country. Uh, but I-70 comes right through Missouri and then into Kansas and from Kansas to Missouri, et cetera. Uh, when they were building that highway, they took out half of Strawberry Hill. The homes were gone, and here went the highway. And so now you have a, a lower section where there's some industrial things. But in the early days, that was known as the Patch. or uh, The Irish Patch. The Irish Patch. Okay. And there was Irish Parish. The very first uh, uh, organization.
organization of a Catholic church in the area was uh, of St. Mary's, and it was an Irish parish. Does it remain so today? It's No, it doesn't. Okay. It's not only the building is closed, uh, and it's actually kind of boarded up, but it's going to be used for maybe a museum or something of that nature. Right. It was merged with the parish up the hill, a block, which was German. Uh, by right. the way, a, a block the other direction is a parish for the Croatians. Right. Uh, uh, let's see, about four blocks to the south, there's one for the Slovenians. Well, that, that does. You take have very, years. very strong ethnic areas. Right. Then when the when the not only when the highway, but the Irish were really there in the late 1800s. Right. And they worked in the armor packing house in the swift packing house right and they worked on the railroads that was some of the incentive that people had to come here to the midwest and because of the farmland right it was magnificent farmland as there still is and they and dug the streets a lot of i go back to the 1870s 1880s i can't remember the exact issues but i was looking for irish names and i couldn't find as many as i wanted although the publisher of one of the early the earliest paper was a kennedy but I was looking, and I found finally found some street crews. They ever tried ties, and they were all run by Doherty with five or six, seven Irish names underneath it. And I found the street crews. I thought that was interesting, but they hadn't really risen to uh, prominence, at least in the newspaper way back then. No. They, though, you know, as in so many other cities throughout the country, uh, the fire departments and the police departments uh, were... Uh, Dominated at times by uh, the Irish. Any uh, Pendergast legends remain from KCK? Not, no, not that I'm familiar with. We had to, the bosses in our part of the state, our part of the metropolitan area, actually were Croatian. Okay. Uh, they merged over onto the other side. And uh, the thing with the patches, there was a problem, the truth is, that the armor, the, the Irish were started striking against the packing houses. Right. So the packing houses, the, the owners of the packing houses, of the armors and the swifts, went to Eastern Europe because you're looking at a time that before World War I, when there was a change in the, in, in the geography and in the politics in Europe, they recruited people from there and told them to come to the packing house, work for us, there's gold in the streets. And they brought a lot of Eastern Europeans who moved into the same area right around where the packing houses were, which was Irish. Oh, my. Well, then the Irish, the strike was broken by bringing in these others. And so the Irish, who then lost their jobs, wouldn't because they struck. Except, oh, yeah. And they started moving out. Then there was a great flood in 1901. And that destroyed a lot of the houses along the Kansas River. Right. And so then they just moved up. Even though the, the Irish had grown, they had to put another Catholic church, St. Bridget's, down in that area. So there was St. Mary's, which was the first established one on this side of the Kansas, uh, on, on this side of Kansas. Right. The first church established by the people coming from St. Louis. Then they had to build St. Bridget's, which was the second church. Is that Does that exist? No, it's gone. They're both gone. They're both gone. How quickly time erases oh. uh, what marks we've left. Well, they moved. The Irish then moved really to St. Peter's, which is the cathedral and the parish I live in, the cathedral of the Catholic Archdiocese. And then other Irish moved out further west, more of the farmers, and built St. Patrick's. Okay. Which is a thriving parish in Kansas City, Kansas. Right. Though not because of Irish there. The, the Irish are now scattered throughout the community. Yeah, it's now an American community. Absolutely. The, the yeah. sub-communities just exist part-time. Right. In, really. in, in your remembering your heritage and, and what you support and the organizations to which you belong to. Like I was saying with the Top of the Morning Club, which has, has lasted since 1953, so, you know, we it's already here of 55 years. What about uh, things like if you, if you go back, of course, it's not going back that far, but... Any remnants of a power structure of Irish Americans in the police department or the fire department or traditions? Do you, does that strike you as anything or is it really? Ours was, was very – the first mayor of Kansas City, Kansas and its incorporation, uh, his parents were Irish and he was – but he was born here. Right. And right. so we did have that. But there's two kinds. I mean in terms of who's, who's who, you know, the – from the political side of the and the Civil War and, and how the Irish dealt, 150,000 Irishmen fought for the North and 40,000 fought for the South, give or take a few numbers there, I'm sure. Right. And uh, there were many Irish here. We had judges 
and commissioners who were Irish. Right. And so they did. They got in politics just like the rest. Some in the police department and the fire department, and they were still there. But it's always been the place where the lower ethnic groups coming in were able to find themselves civil service jobs. Now, what about Mayor? There was uh, Mayor Reardon over in uh, yes. KCK. Now he was Irish. Did he recognize his heritage? Oh, very much so. Uh, when Jack uh, was mayor, he attempted uh, to establish a sister city in Ireland. Right. And so I was on the board with him to do that, and we worked at that. It didn't come to fruition, but now his son is the mayor of Kansas City, Kansas, and uh, he is attempting to do uh, some Irish sister city uh, work in Ireland. Okay, so there, there's still an ethnic recognition oh, sure. and connection there. Uh, and see, Kansas City, Kansas has sister cities with um, with Mexico, with Austria, and with Croatia. Right. And there is a great feeling. And the interesting thing is people from all of the ethnic groups help each other to put these sister city groups together because we appreciate the diversity of our ethnic groups within the community. Well, that's what makes may, has made a big part of what's made America a success because we, we can borrow from each other and take the best... That's right. Possible the strengths, absolutely. From each. Are there any other Irish meeting places you can think of over the last 20, 30 years uh, that you might have gone to to meet people other than the, the Falcon Club? or? Uh, right. And we used to use St. Elizabeth's Church uh, for dances. Right. Uh, 75th and Main. That was always considered a big place. Guardian Angels. Uh, Guardian Angels also, was another one. Yeah, that yes. par- the parish hall there, that was common. And it, I, as I look at it, I've said to people many different times, if we went years ago and there seemed to be a lot of the Irish around, uh, there were very few Irish pubs and things in town. You know, we knew the Falcon Club. And then one in Merge was called the Irish Brigade. Right. It was very big, and they brought in entertainers from all over the country. And then there was a void. There was none. Today, they seem to be opening up everywhere. Oh, that's right. Even though two have recently closed... But they uh, which which two have gone down? McBrides. Oh yeah, right. Both right. of them. And would you and call that a, would you call that an Irish meeting place, or no, was it just it, a, a modern Irish bar that had an Irish name? It was a, a modern uh, a modern bar with an Irish theme, but some of the guys who owned it were Irish or were attempting to do a little revival. Right. And there's been a few others that they were fellows from Ireland who were doing different things, and that tried. But most of it is because. People just look for themes right. today. We have some of our Irish singers are playing in some of these places. Uh, the last one, actually, if you really want to go to an Irish place, uh, our friend uh, Eddie Delahunt, and Eddie's opened up a cafe. It's just it's breakfast, sandwiches, and coffees right. and teas. And But you always find the Irish paper there. Some of the Irish from around town, you can go and sit and visit and have a nice time. Now, and Eddie Delahunt, he would be from Dublin, wouldn't he? Eddie is from Dublin, yes. Okay, that's right. So that's that's a good sign. I, I know a lot of people go down to Weston, too, to hear uh, right, uh, some O'Malley's. Irish music circuit. Yes. People come in there. It's a much smaller place, but it's got a nice feel to it. It does. And it, it, it's an old wine cellar's uh, place. It's got different levels. Oh, yeah, it dates back. I don't know and how so many it's, years. It's from the mid-1800s. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, that's, that's true. And it has every week, it has some Irish activities, but it's in a little town, and how, what, how many miles? It's 40 miles from Kansas City. Oh, right. So it, it's something that serves another section of the community. Uh, and there are a couple of others with Irish names, but uh, unfortunately, so many places think that uh, you have, it's corned beef and cabbage, that equals being Irish. And if you don't have that, uh, then you're not Irish at all. But I always look for the place where I could see the Irishman. When you were asking about the fellas, when you thought about Wally Bell uh, and right. uh, P.J. Cullinan. Oh, that's right. And, you know, all those fellas who were just, you just sat and enjoyed listening to them. That's right. And, and Bob Carney. Right. And his brother John. And it was just a, a real pleasure to be with those fellas who had come over from Ireland Years ago, uh, they came over and they worked at, in the gas company, worked as bus drivers. They, they worked as taxi cab drivers. That's you know, right. They just did the old things. And they were just loving being here, but loving to talk about old Ireland. You know, we, we all enjoyed that. And I'm thinking now, what about today? I, don't, I haven't been real active in, in the city, so to speak. I've been more active uh, on a national level with my books, and that's taken all my energy. But what about the—there's uh, a whole crew of Irish— 
a lot more than it used to be. Irish born, and they started up the Celtic Fringe yes. organization. That's sort of a new. It was, and as uh, Celtic Fringe was uh, started basically by themselves to be a support group for young people from Ireland who came here to Kansas City. But they came to Kansas City because they knew of the old connections with some of the names we mentioned. And the families would talk about going back to Ireland, saying, well, if you're going here, go to this family or that family. And because of the strong ties that the Hibernians have had with Ireland and have made themselves known in many fa uh, segments, whether it be politics or whether it be music or, uh, or, or tourism. Right. I think you can contrast the 1950s where you probably just came in and you were uh, uh, much more isolated as far as getting some official help from an Irish group, and whereas today there's a whole organization set up and it's a lot of fun, a lot of young folks in there, yeah, not, not just the old guys. And uh, so that's been a big change really in 50 years. Yes, it has. And the other thing is, like when we mentioned Eddie Delahunt, and there's, uh, Bob Reeder is also a singer, but he's not uh, from Ireland, he's an American. But then we have The Elders, which is a kind of an Irish rock band, and two of the fellows are from Ireland and three aren't. But they have become very, very popular, uh, the style of music as it changes, and they go back to Ireland and take tours with them. And uh, so they have done that. And so people in Ireland recognize that these Irish fellows are doing so well in America, though everybody's doing pretty well in Ireland now, too. But it gives them a place to feel that you could feel at home in Kansas City. What about uh, Walsh's? I got a picture here. I think I want to put it in. Uh, I'm reprinting that book on the history of the Irish in Kansas City, St. Louis, and Missouri. I'm going to put this photo in there. It's got you singing at, what is that? Is that the name of the place, Walsh's? Yeah, well, uh, it's Walsh's Corner Cocktail. It looks like you got a, a little backup accompaniment there. Uh, yeah, that's John Morris. Okay, he's playing and the guitar. He's playing the guitar because uh, I wanted him to play it. I didn't want to play it myself. Well, he only had his. And there's an Irish flag there. And that was, uh, he, he would sing there every, uh, every once in a while. He's actually an assistant football coach for one of our high schools here. Right, I'd be rockers. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, yeah. And Walsh's is uh, an Irish name, and it doesn't really have much of a, an Irish flavor at all. Except, they are except, Irish. Except on an Irish day, a special day. St. Right. Patrick's Day, right. they have the Irish and, and they are Irish. Right. Uh, Pat, who, who runs it. But as far as, um, you know, a real Irish, they, they don't serve Guinness, for instance. And, right. And they, they don't have the food that would be considered Irish in that. You remember the old Kerry Patch? Oh, yes. Uh, that, that was a great place. That was a, that Irish would come there to meet on the way back and forth to the airport sure. out north. It closed down. Uh, Jim Ryan ran. Uh, Jim Dick, Ryan. Dick, Dick, Ryan. Dick Ryan ran that, and that was a, a pretty good place. Uh, and it, it was almost, I remember when that was built in the 70s, late 70s, early 80s, it was almost, we used to think, like, my God, this is too fancy to be Irish. Oh, that, it was a nice place. It was beautiful. Oh, great oh. cuts of meetings and regular Wonderful. waitresses Absolutely. and private rooms. And, yes. And he helped a lot uh, with uh, sort of bringing the community together in a neutral territory sometimes. He and he, and he was very instrumental in the parades in the Northland right. in Kansas City. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we had a separate parade in North Kansas City and still do. Yes. It's a separate, uh, I think it takes place the uh, week before. The main parade in Kansas City, though, they've been pretty good, I think, except with maybe one exception of keeping the parade on St. Patrick's Day, whereas in a lot of other places in, in the country, they uh, they go the week before. Right, and the weekends. That's right. I think that helps give meaning to something when you stick to the real date. That's right. Now, I, we, boy, look how long we've been talking. We've been here almost all these minutes. I think we better get to... Uh, Traveling to Ireland now. Now we mentioned that back in the fifties, very few people really went to Ireland. You know, if you get around and talk to folks, and in the sixties, seventies, it's got bigger. But today, it's bigger than ever. You've got people who've been two, three, four times commonly. And I know that you've been big on uh, the trips to Ireland, taking people from this area to Ireland. Uh, what do you see in the form of travel? How people go and what they enjoy, and, and what the trends are in Ireland. The, the it's becoming very modern. Uh, which isn't a bad thing, especially for when you live there, you know. Oh, that's right. But what's happening that's disappointing to me, and I have been to Ireland 20 different times. Right. And I'm going here in a, in a very short time. I'm going to be traveling over there. When you go into the hotels, and it seems like in any society that rises itself economically, who comes and gets other jobs? 
And we've had some of that experience in the United States where we right. see that. So the lower jobs, we would say a lower job, which actually were the jobs of the, the meat and potatoes of people working for families years ago, right. the waitress, and the, but the hotels. So, of course, with the amount of tourism that's in Ireland, the hotels have blossomed. The old days of the B&B, &B, they're still there, but they're not as common. And they're actually, it seems to me, hurting a little bit. Yeah. But the hotels are booming. And the people who are working in the hotels are generally from Eastern Europe. That's right. So you go to Ireland and you expect to hear that Irish accent yeah. to be part of your experience. And you hear somebody else, which is a whole another special experience, but not the one you were expecting. That's right. And this year... Um, the address by uh, President Mary McAleish, the president of Ireland, she said to the people in Ireland and to the, all the Irish in the world, she says, as we went and have now, you hear such expressions as, I'm an Irish American or I'm an Irish Australian or uh, I'm right. an Irish Canadian. She says, in today's Ireland, we now have Chinese Irish and Romanian Irish and Pakistani Irish. It's that Ireland has become, in a sense, uh, a place like the United States was that people yearn to go to because they knew that there you would have a good life. And that's what's happened in Ireland. Ireland has become, it's its a little bit more expensive than we would like it, well, you especially know, it, with the euro. How about, you know, I, I remember I got some prices when I was taking groups over to Ireland's lowest 25, 28 Irish pounds a night at B&Bs. What do you think they're charging now? Well... If you go to a city uh, that uh, they're charging 80 euros, which is about $120. Now, that's just amazing. That's, oh, it's ridiculous. It's, just, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's more than Dublin uh, for a nice you can, you, can, you can still get hotels uh, in some places for $100 a night. Right. Double, double occupancy. And, but they were going to, in, in the hotels, it's been a push to do uh, charge by the room, not by the person. Yeah. And I mean, obviously, but a maximum of three people in the room, generally, that kind of a thing. Right. But in Ireland, remember that breakfast is always free. So, you know, we talk about B&B, &B, and what does that mean? And it meant your bed and breakfast, obviously. Right. But in the hotels, they actually operated as B&Bs. So you got your stay in the hotel, plus you got your breakfast. But times have changed. Money has changed. But Ireland is still a wonderful uh, and enchanting place. And when you stop in the little towns, that's where it really is at. Then you, uh, you feel Ireland, and you get to appreciate the beauty and the spirit of the Irish people. Well, now, which I know you're doing several trips. There might be some people that want to tie into what you're you're doing or go with you on a trip to Ireland because, gosh, you could beat it. You might be able to cook them breakfast if the B and B was, was in trouble or sing them a there song. There you go. You never know that. But what kind of what what time of the year do you go and and where do you usually stay? Well, uh, I'm leaving here in a month, and I'm going to be over there for a month. Two different groups will be coming, uh, and I've I've done. Uh, Yesterday, actually, I wrote a new tour to go next March to be able to be really kind of Easter. Easter's very early. Right. St. Patrick's Day next in 2008 is on Monday of Holy Week. Right. So that puts the spring breaks and thing. I've done that with students and now this time with adults. Uh, it depends, actually. I try to uh, fit things in when people would be interested. If I get a group that's interested in going at a time, I'll make all the arrangements for them. And, of course, go with them and sing a few songs on the coach and do whatever else is necessary and tell them where to go and what to go and what to do and who to see, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the best times, you know, the, the time people usually go is, of course, the times that are the most crowded, and that is June, July, and August. And July and August are the most crowded months, uh, and everything is open. But right. Ireland, uh, most of the tourism, uh, the things that are open in terms of shops and tourism, right, they're open from uh, middle March or the 1st of April to the end of September. Oh, Though right. people are extending that into, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day, he said he saw that I had a trip he wanted to know, and he said he'd like to go in like October. And I said, well, we could, that would still be fine. Still be fun. Not right. a lot of the touristy, touristy things are open. Right, but on the other but, hand, that might be better. Sure. Then you, if the touristy, touristy things aren't open, that means the tourists aren't there. Ah, that's which right. Which gives you the opportunity to find what I like to call the real Ireland. Go out and meet some of the people out in the smaller towns and see what's really there. That's right. I think you've developed that up into an art. <coughs> and uh, people have, if you're in, I've talked to a few people and people have really enjoyed your trips of being something special, not out of a glossy magazine, but you, something you've put together. And 
and you watch over like a mother hen. This is true. Uh, you got to take care of those folks you when do. they go with you. Oh, and I, I just, uh, and I love doing that. Well, how, if, if somebody wanted to get a hold of you anytime, uh, seeing the dates change and trips change, what's the best way? I know that anybody contact me here at the Irish Roots Cafe, I can put them in touch with you. Is there a, a way that they might, over the next couple of years, an address or a phone number? Sure. I could give them an email. Sure. And that's the easiest way. To, and it would be um, Beaufort, B-E-A-U-F-O-R-T, 1916, at AOL.com. Oh, gotcha. 1916. That's a important date in history, isn't it? It is. It's the year of the Easter Rising. Well, I'll be doggone easy. Which uh, next week is the 91st anniversary of the Rising. And next week would be? April 24th. April 24th. That's right. Now, we'll probably... And in 1916, April the 24th was Easter Monday morning. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. See, you're tied into history no matter what you do. Oh, yeah. A person hangs around you, they're going to learn something (laughs) just by being there, just by osmosis. Well, is there anything else not you got the last chance to talk to history here? Not that we wouldn't have you back again, but in, in this episode, is there anything else you, you think you might have forgotten uh, uh, just at this moment? I was just thinking about the, the people that I met, but the one thing it did for me is it made me feel a very much a part of the community, and I have become an integral part of the community. Oh, yes. But what, what it is is be proud of who you're, what your heritage is and who you are in that, and you will find that there are people out there who are just as interested as you are, but they sometimes need an ear or a shoulder or just a friend to call and talk about being Irish and being a part. And before you know it, you're forming a top of the morning club or having a chapter of the ancient order of Hibernians or just sitting around listening to some Irish music. Hey, that's right. And, you know, after you've done that for 10 or 20 years, you meet some friends that are Italian or Scandinavian and you get involved in their operations. And that makes it all the more fun. Oh, absolutely. It, there's, absolutely. There's just no end to what it can do, because really recognizing your, your history doesn't separate you from the rest of the world. It really brings you closer together once you, you really delve more deeply into it. The DNA test will tell you that. That's the truth. That's the truth. Well, Peter, it's been real good uh, talking to you. I hope to... Uh, have you back again later on in these podcasts, but these first 10, I wanted to have uh, some of the movers and shakers in the community that I've met over the past uh, 30 or 40 years. And you certainly rank up there uh, as one of the best and somebody that really can contact the entire community. And that's a rare thing. So I'd like to thank you for everything you've done for the Irish community in the last decades and wish you all the best in the future. Well, thank you, Michael. And this is a wonderful opportunity. These uh, podcasts are certainly uh, Uh, an investment in the future of uh, not only our community, but all across the country and the world. Appreciate it. Great. Thank you, Peter. Talk to you later. Well, we set a record today, folks. This is Michael Laughlin at the Irish Roots Cafe. Reach me anytime at irishroots.com where you can find all of our books and podcasts, including our Irish Families Worldwide podcast. It's all at irishroots.com. And be sure to check the show notes for this episode on our webpage. Donations and comments are welcome, and a big thank you to all of our members who make all of this possible. That's all, folks. Until next time, we meet here, right where Ireland met Kansas City at the Irish Roots Cafe.